Okay, so welcome back for afternoon session. Uh, we have Ken McLaughlin. He's going to tell us about interactions between solitons and with other nonlinear wave fields. Tom, thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here in, in, in person and to try to learn about um, about this field, which is not my field. So, um, and now for something completely different. <laughs> Um, but there's, uh, well, there's at least there's a numerical linear algebra problem that, that appears. I made sure of that by typing it in. So, um, so I'll uh, talk about work with, um, with this crew, Manuela Girotti, um, Bob Jenkins, Tamara Grava, and Alexander Minikoff. Um, will this work? It's work? Okay. So um, you can't see the, up the top, but solitons are fundamental solutions of nonlinear evolution equations. Um, and I'll work by example, so you'll see them in action, okay? Um, and integrable nonlinear PDEs, they possess not just single soliton solutions, which you could think of as being boring. But they have multiple uh, funny looking solutions which, in which there are many solitons propagating together and they kind of, they may spread out, they may over, overlap, uh, overtake each other. Um, and so the, the, the first example is a two soliton solution. So up there is the modified KDV equation, the nonlinear partial differential equation for a, a function Q of X and T. And the first thing you can do is you can say, I want to find a traveling wave solution. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about, sort of uh, special solutions of PDEs. Okay, so you can say, I want to find a traveling wave solution. You make a guess, Q equals F of X minus CT. Okay, that's a guess. And then you can derive an ODE that, that this function f should satisfy, and that gives you a single soliton. It's actually the, the solution is some sech, sech of x or something. So you get a single soliton, but that's kind of boring. This is an exact solution of this equation plotted using Mathematica. And um, um, so you, you see there are two peaks, and they, they uh, both are traveling to the right. Um, and the, uh, the smaller peak is traveling at a much slower velocity. Now, in this time zone in here, um, they're not exactly traveling as peaks, as you can see. But as they separate again, they're, they're, um, they're traveling uh, again as individual peaks. And so they kind of interact like maybe, maybe like particles, and then they spread back out on the other side, OK? So I, I wanted to stop it in the middle here. Uh, oops, let me go back. So that uh, you can see something uh, interesting. So I will um, put my finger on the peak of the small soliton right here. So just watch as the tall soliton slides past it. My finger is right there at the peak. And as the tall soliton slides past it, the, the peak moves to the left. Okay. And so what actually is happening is the, um, when, they're, when they're interacting, okay, they're, they're actually evolving um, not exactly um, in straight sort of uh, linear motion, but they're they're accelerating, okay. And so on the next slide is the same exact movie in the upper left hand corner. Uh, the dot, the red dot, is the position of the tall peak, and and this is the um, the velocity of the tall peak, and that's the acceleration of the tall peak. So you can see that it's experiencing some kind. If if you wish to interpret it that way, it's experiencing a force, okay, due to the interaction. All right. So that that's um sort of it's a, it's a s explicit solution of a nonlinear PDE, but when you look at it, you can start start to think okay they maybe they behave like particles, okay, and so that's sort of I'll come back to that, but but um so this is a slide that's supposed to explain how um integrable partial differential equations are solved. I'm going to skip it and just say that there's magic involved with producing a, a way to represent solutions of these equations that allows you to like complete exactly solvable systems just as um as Elliot mentioned in this case it's an exactly solvable system where you can represent the solution very explicitly okay um okay what just happened oh yeah so the so this is now um you, you might ask wouldn't it be great if we could if we could um sort of see a formula which would exactly encapsulate easily all of the all of the features of that movie, and there it is, you know, celebrated. Of course, you can see all of the features of the movie from this explicit formula for the for the uh, solution. Um, 
Okay, so there's another way to characterize the uh, the two soliton solution, which is in terms of a um, a meromorphic problem in the plane. So here's a, a weird problem. It's actually connected to a linear algebra problem, very simple one that I'll explain to you. Okay, the problem is um, find m1 and m2. Well, they're right there, but let me describe the properties they satisfy. So they're each uh, meromorphic functions in the plane. M1 has a pole at each of those two dots in the upper half plane, uh, I K1 or I kappa 1 and I kappa 2. And M2 has poles in the lower half plane at um, negative I kappa 1 and negative I kappa 2. They, the, each of these functions goes to 1 as lambda goes to infinity. And the residue of each of these um, poles of M1 is related to the value of M2 at that same place. So if you look up there, I wrote something crazy. Residue at uh, I K2 of M equals limit M times this nilpotent matrix. What that says really is that the residues of the M1 are connected to the values of M2 at the same point. And in the lower half plane, the residue of, um, of uh, M2 is connected to the value of M1. That's what that um, that second condition is supposed to say if I'd written negative i k one, but I, you know, I didn't write it that way. But okay, so um, so um, that's a problem. Can you find m one and m two in in explicit form? And if you can, then you look at the behavior at infinity of m one and um, take basically the first one over land term at infinity, and that is now a function only of x and t. Because um, as you see, the, uh, the residue conditions have an X and a T in them. And that um, function of X and T solves the, uh, the modified KDB equation. Okay, so it's a way to en encode solutions. It's a little bit complicated, but think of it as a meromorphic problem. Find these two meromorphic functions that are related in this way, okay? Um, now, how would you do that? You would. Well, so here's what, what I would do. I would make a guess that M looks like uh, one at infinity plus some constant over lambda minus I K one, another constant over lambda minus I kappa two, that those represent the poles in the upper half plane. And this the second entry of M, M two is one. And then it's got some poles in the lower half plane at I kappa one and I kappa two, Just make a guess. Okay, so remember, I'm trying to find M one and M two that satisfy these conditions up above. So you make this guess, and then you write down the, you rewrite the residue conditions. I'm not gonna do that for you because that's just too technical but, or tedious, but what you get is a system of equations for alpha one and alpha two, okay? I worked, I wrote them out, you know, secretly while, while, uh, while um, you know, in the middle of the night un under, um, under great duress, I wrote them out and, and they look like this. So um, it's a two by two matrix I, the identity matrix, plus A times the vector A equals this explicit right hand side. And A is uh, this matrix here. Okay, now uh, theta one is purely imaginary and theta two is purely imaginary. So it's a real matrix whose determinant is non zero. So you can solve this problem. So that's, I'd say, the first uh, linear algebra problem that I present to you. It's a two by two one. We can all solve it. And when you do solve it, you get this, uh, eventually, you get this, <laughs> okay? Now, what's, I'll tell you what's weird, and, and uh, you know, since, since this is sort of um, out, you know, from maybe left field, what's, uh, what's interesting is that um, depending upon the choice of X and T, these entries could be, could be very, very small. And if these entries are very, very small, then I'm solving a, a identity plus small matrix easy to solve it, okay? Now, however, it's also the case that for different choices of X and T, these entries are all enormous. And then I'm solving, a, a, okay, a different problem and inverting it can be um, tedious and hard to control the, the, um, the error, okay? Um, all right, so, but let me go back and just give you some intuition because, you know, this is a different area that, than maybe some of you have seen before, and it's, it's kind of interesting to see how we study it. So I want to explain one of the features of the movie that you saw at the beginning, okay? And if, if I go back to the beginning, just so you see the picture again, uh, right here, uh, if I choose X, this is T equals zero, say, but if I choose X um, very near this point here, 
then I ought to be able to say this is a set squared function, okay? And if I separately choose x over here, I ought to be able to say the same thing. That's a really a nice, simple function. Turns out that it's, it's, it's hyperbolic secant squared, okay? So how do you see that from this crazy linear algebra problem? And how, how would you see it from uh, this meromorphic problem in the plane, okay? So let's suppose that t is very large negative number so that the two peaks are very far apart. And x is very close to, okay, it turns out this is the center of that, of that leftmost peak. So if I make those two assumptions, and I, it's very hard to read it because um, I did that on purpose, but um, the first term up there is actually order one. The element, the, the quantity inside the exponent is, is uh, zero. And so that entry is an order one entry, whereas the, the, uh, the other residue condition over here is exponentially small. And that means I should be able to look for a meromorphic function where I just don't care about that second pole, okay? So similarly, I didn't write them out, but there's also a pole uh, here that I won't care about because this residue condition is small and this pole is gonna be order one. And so there's now a simplified problem where there's only one pole in the upper half and one pole in the lower half plane to deal with. And I'm skipping all the steps, but, um, but what you learn by doing that is that you get the exact single traveling wave solution plus error terms by ignoring the small pole, okay? That's fun, just for fun, okay? Now, um, if I then choose, still t is very large negative number, but now choose x near the center of the other peak, then things reverse and that, this uh, entry at i kappa two, it turns out is small, and the other entries order one, and so you ignore the small one and keep the, the large one, and you find again a set profile, but it's centered at um, x equal four kappa one squared t, as opposed to x equals four kappa two squared t. So that's analysis, okay? And here's some, I'm gonna skip this next step a little bit, but just so you see what, what kind of crazy things can happen, if I take t very large positive and try to play the same game, then, well, that term is still order one, but the other term is no longer exponentially small, but it's, it's giant. Okay, so let me just give you, a, as an outline form, go back to this matrix. What that means is that in that region, that matrix, matrix on the lower left-hand side, two by two, has got some gar gargantuan entries, okay? And yet, um, and yet, um, there's a trick. I'm going to skip the trick. In the interest of time, nobody wants to see the linear algebraic complex variables uh, trickery that goes into this right now. But the trick basically winds up saying that all that happens is the center of each of those two peaks has been shifted. Okay? So, so somehow, even though the matrix is now kind of badly posed for, for um, analysis, what winds up happening is a very simple adjustment to the, uh, the solution of the nonlinear PDE, okay? So I figure that's too much detail to go into, but, okay, but if you want to see that, you know, I, I can show that it's, it's sort of fun complex variables over a cup of coffee or um, other beverage. Uh, so that was, remember, that was a two, the case in which we call it a two soliton solution. That's because there's these two peaks and they kind of slosh about, okay? So, so, um, but now I, I want to end. So what if the number two is replaced by like 25, 30, you know, you can even imagine going as large as 35. Okay. Okay. So, well, so with, for an arbitrary N, um, I'm just posing a very similar problem. Find a, a, um, a pair of functions M1 and M2. They're meromorphic in the plane, okay? And then um, at each of the poles in the upper half plane, the, the, uh, the first entry, M1, its residues are related to the value of M2 at those same locations, okay? And then um, at the, in the lower half plane, the, the uh, poles of M2, their, its residues are related to the values of M1 at those places. So it's a kind of um, convoluted collection of identities. Can you find M1 and M2? Um, okay. Okay, that's the, so yes, you can. 
and if you if you go through so if you can then you look at the kind of one over lambda term at infinity that's what this crazy formula here is just take m1 go out to infinity take off the first the constant look at the one over lambda term by multiplying by lambda and then okay you got to take a derivative but, but then you get this a uh, solution to the kdv equation to the modified kdv equation again and um it's now has within it n solitons and what that means is like if i let t be very large negative then there's n peaks that are separated from each other and if i let t be very large positive then there are again n peaks separated from each other but in the middle they're kind of sloshing about and maybe they're maybe they're overtaking each other and it's it's um you know think of it as a bunch of particles interacting okay so so it's a linear algebra problem and n is getting large you know th i was I was joking about 35. It could be as many as 36, 53, okay? Um, so, so I've rewritten things here, uh, and now it's the modified, and again, it's, it's uh, right, I just, I just reorganized things, okay? So it's now sort of occupying the top of the screen so that I can uh, put this down. This is the guess that you would make. I'm now looking at, okay, I'm, I'm, I've changed to the different system in which there's now a, a matrix of unknowns, not just a row vector, M1 and M2, but there's M1, 1, M1, 2, M2, 1, and M2, 2, but it's the same thing, okay? And I'm making a, I'm, I'm representing the solution now as a sum of uh, one plus something which has poles at all of the I cap is in the upper half plane, and then the second uh, column has got poles at all the I cap is in the lower half plane, so negative I cap of one, negative I cap of two, et cetera, okay? And the, the um, okay, now I've, I've got many more quantities. So I have alphas and betas, and those are just the residues. And again, uh, you can imagine writing, working out the details of how to turn this into a linear algebra, some matrix equation for just the alphas and the betas. And I've skipped that except to show you what they are. Alpha plus A times beta is zero, and beta minus A times alpha is, okay, some explicit known quantities. And the matrix A takes this form. Okay, so it's a giant matrix, you know, size n, n by n matrix, in which the entries look like this. So it's kind of reminiscent of matrices, which, uh, you know, the, the uh, okay, let me say this carefully. It kind of looks like um, the uh, matrix, you, the, the van der Mond type determinant you might get for the induced eigenvalues on a random matrix, except that it's one over kappa j plus kappa l, but it's in the, it happens to be in the same universe. Okay. Uh, okay, so so that and I, the last point I want to make is that okay that that matrix depending upon x and t can have entries that are that are small in which case it's sort of easy to solve the system or they can have entries that are large and um, you know what what we do actually is carry out analysis to try to understand the behavior of the solution of this system, regardless of the size of, of the entries of the matrix, okay? And it's like um, management, management of, the, um, of the system by, by a sequence of transformations that I'm not gonna go through, okay? But here's a, a couple of fun formulae. So in this, with this very large system, you can actually represent the solution of the, um, of the modified KDV equation as a, a couple of derivatives, so a derivative of a log of a Fredholm determinant. It's an n by n Fredholm determinant. So it's kind of um, again, integrable systems kicks rears its head, and you we have representations in terms of um, you know resolvents of of quantities that are kind of connected to um to um well integral equations, discrete integral equations though. Okay. All right. So. I told you what a soliton solution is, what a two soliton solution is, and what an n soliton solution is, okay? And I just babbled a little bit to explain what the, um, uh, how you characterize them in terms of this meromorphic problem in the plane, okay? That's where we are. <clears throat> so, um, so here's some, some history, you know, from, again, from a different, Maybe a slightly different area, but in the in the um, solitons were really discovered in the 18, uh, 1820s, 30s, 1840s. Um, but then um, 
put on a mathematically uh, firm basis in the 1880s by Corteveg and De Vries, then they went dormant until the 60s when, when, um, when kind of it was realized that there are, there are equations with, which have many, many solid pond solutions. Okay, so, so I will now fast forward to 1971. Uh, Zakharov was cons considering the, the interaction of a dilute gas of soliton. So that means he's, he's imagining having the, the system that I described, right? Many, many solitons, and they're interacting, but, but he made these, these, he wanted to describe a kind of a statistical theory of these particles, okay? And so what he did is he said, let me assume that every time they interact, they behave as though there are only two of them interacting. And for two of them, I know exactly how they interact, okay? And that led him to, to pose a, um, well, so before that, so these two formulae represent the interaction. This is sort of the, the two separated solitons before they've interacted. One is centered at four a to one squared t, the other is centered at four a to two squared t. And after they interact, um, the one that was formerly centered at four a to one squared t has been shifted to the left by this amount. And the one centered at four a to two squared t has been shifted to the right by that amount. So, so he knew that, and then he said, well, if, if I have a gas of them, then I should be able to kind of sum up the contributions um, and um, sort of compute the average adjustment in position for a, a tracer soliton, and then uh, declare that, that it's a, altered its velocity. So I need a kinetic equation for the velocity of that soliton. And, and this formula here represents the velocity of the soliton. If this term wasn't there, it would just be exactly the the four eta squared that I had before, but this piece is sort of the contribution accumulated by interacting with a bunch of other solitons, okay? So that he called the kinetic theory of solitons. And, um, um, okay, and then that was sort of extended. I'm gonna skip this because it's sort of, uh, I just babbled through it anyway. It was extended by uh, L and collaborators to a case when, this, when, the, uh, when the solitons are not quite so dilute. There's actually a, a density of them interacting, okay? And, and so it's, it's now, a, a, instead of it being a formula for the soliton velocity, it's an equation. So you see this S, the speed, appears on both sides of that equation at the top. So you then have to solve that equation or prove that equation has a solution or prove that it doesn't have a solution or prove that it has multiple solutions and then use it, okay? For good or for bad, it's up to you. Okay. Um, okay. So, so if if you want to think about it from a from a um, a bird's eye view, I've now described a situation where where really there's randomness, right? I've got a bunch of these peaks, and their locations is actually not exactly determined, so maybe they're random. And I want to study how they interact with each other and try to derive an effective law for their velocities. So there's there's like a a statistical theory of ga of a gas of these solitons, which is which is being suggested. Okay, so so um at the same time, there's no rigorous analysis of, of this um you know of this collection of stories. There's only now starting to emerge some rigorous analysis, and I'll tell you about one of those uh, analyses, which has no randomness whatsoever, no randomness at all. Okay, so um all right, so um so. About what's that? Five, six years ago, Diachenko, Zakharov, and Zakharov, they uh, they constructed a, a new class of solutions, potentials for the the KDV equation. And I summarized them here, but I'll just you know I'm not gonna. You, you don't need to look at this except to, to these pictures. There's a bunch of poles accumulating on this line, and a bunch of poles accumulating on this line. Okay, and the number of poles is going to infinity. Okay, um, and what did they do? They showed that such potentials that are following this kind of limiting process exist, and they were able to study them um, for, for space in sort of a half line, spatially in one direction. But the analysis in the other direction was, was sort of uh, challenging both numerically for them and also analytically. And they were, I think they wound up using like quadruple precision mathematica calculations. Which, which please just say, thank you. Um, okay, sorry? Yes, it is, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so, um, so a Riemann-Hilbert problem, so no longer a meromorphic problem, but a Riemann-Hilbert problem emerges in the limit. That's, um, 
where you you seek now um, functions that are analytic uh, in sort of the complex plane take away some intervals, okay? And it's I won't go through the details of this, but um, but uh, with this gang of collaborators, we carried out an asymptotic analysis of this Riemann-Hilbert problem, and what we showed is that. Um, uh, this limit uh, exists for all x, and it, it satisfies the kinetic equations that, that were derived in the 70s, okay? So, um, so it really is a limit of solitons when n goes to infinity. We carried out the long time analysis, and, um, and then we even uh, later, you'll see a movie, but we, we decided to take a tracer soliton, a very tall peak, on top of this kind of um, this limit of solitons and watch the interaction, watch and, and carry out an analysis of the interaction with them. Okay. So, um, so this is a, a snapshot of our analytical result, the asymptotic result. And what you see is a, a kind of a modulating oscillatory wave train here. It's a snapshot in time. Okay. A modulating wave train here and a fixed kind of oscillatory wave here going all the way out to infinity. And on the right, it's just zero. Okay, the right hand side is just zero. Okay, so that's that's a picture, a kind of a characteristic picture of the solution of the PDE, uh, the modified KDV equation that was derived by Diachenko, Zakharov, and Zakharov. Okay. All right. Um, now. If, if, you, um, if you play in the random matrix theory universe and you know about equilibrium measures and the limiting density of eigenvalues, and um, it turns out that the dynamics of this crazy uh, s collection of solutions of, of the partial differential equation that I'm dealing with, their, their dynamics is driven by a, uh, a, a density function, rho, which is determined by solving um, this variational this, this uh, Euler-Lagrange equations that come from some very variational problem, very similar to what pops up in random matrix theory, okay? So that's just, you know, uh, in, in, it, it, the methods are very, very similar. Okay, and it just turns out that, that if I take this density of, um, of um, solitons, then I form the quantity uh, derivative of rho with respect to t divided by derivative of rho with respect to x, that satisfies um, a kinetic equation. I'm saying, I'm, I'm sharing that because it turns out that, that the same thing is true in random matrix theory. If you consider kind of dynamical evolution of, of uh, the density of states of a random matrix with, res with respect to the, um, the parameters in the external field, that, um, that the, uh, the density also generates a solution of kinetic equations in that case. There's some crazy connection between these two areas that you know remains to be investigated. Uh, okay. So, so you know, remember when I, I made a joke that, oh, this beautiful uh, ra rational function that really encapsulates all of the phenomena of the two soliton solution. So, so this for us is the characterization of a, uh, a gas of solitons, that's what these two bands are, and that's this, and that represents a gas of solitons, and a tracer soliton sitting on top of that gas evolving. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so it, it was, it's somewhat artificial, so that, that's, um, you know, we just used we use built-in uh, elliptic theta functions in, in Mathematica and, and produce the solution that way. Yeah, yeah, we evaluated the asymptotic formula and then just plugged that into Mathematica and had it. That's purely the asymptotic description, yeah. The error is one over T. So if T is very large, this is, the solution looks like this plus an error term of order one over T. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so where am I? Okay, so, so this is now um, our uh, way to characterize a, a solution, which is a single very tall uh, soliton riding along um, this background wave that I showed you a picture of, okay? 
All right, so, and, and the only asymptotic parameter now in sight is the distance between the soliton and the gas. I'll show you what that means. And don't worry, I'm aware of the time. I think I have like 40 minutes left. Tom, is that right? <laughs> 50, I'm just kidding. Okay, I, I know, I know, 10, nine minutes, something like that. I know, I'm aware. Don't worry. Okay. So, um, so here's a, 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 our analytical result about that, that uh, last picture, okay? So if this parameter kappa naught, that's the, the, the height of that additional pole, if that's large enough, then there is a global maximum of this uh, solution, which is called X peak of T, a single location of a, a red dot, if you will, okay? And um, the solution at that value of X peak is actually the background wave plus some very large profile. So, so it's an isolated local global maximum, isolated global maximum. And this quantity is strictly increasing and satisfies these conditions, okay? So up until the time that this, this uh, tracer soliton has not interacted with the, the soliton gas, it's just, it's essentially following straight line motion. Then uh, it begins to interact with a, a modulated gas, and then it breaks through to the other side where it's now propagating on top of a kind of a quiescent gas of solitons. And the, the velocity, this is the dot up top up, above, means the velocity of this global peak is oscillating. Okay, so, so this, you can't see it, but I'm just, I'm telling you, this is an oscillatory function of T. And so the velocity is oscillating back and forth as it's moving to the right. Okay, so that's the picture. And um, I'm going to skip this detail about the, the phase shift in the gas because that's, I didn't explain that at all, so I'll just skip it. But uh, now the movie. So, so you can see that this is again, uh, Sheehan, this is a plot of the, of the asymptotic result. Okay, so there's no error in this. We haven't produced the full solution of the PDE, um, which would be, we should do that, right? I mean, that's, I, I, that's not, it's beyond my skill set, but, but I can make, make uh, plots that come from uh, asymptotic formulae. So this distance is the asymptotic parameter, okay? So at t equals zero, I've got a, a single very large peak far to the left and uh, a kind of a, a modulated uh, oscillatory wave train here, and then a regular oscillatory wave train here. That's the snapshot at t equals zero. Okay, so let's watch it evolve. And um, so uh, what you'll see as it as it evolves through is it, it's it's just moving at fixed velocity right now. Once it starts to interact with this with um, with this modulated region, the velocity and the height of the peak, everything starts to oscillate, and you'll see that. And just remind you, none of this, there is no randomness in this, okay? So, so of course, that's what we want to do is we, we, we want to, um, to try to understand why the same kinetic equations, which are supposed to govern the, the behavior under random initial conditions, work without randomness. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, if you think about it from the point of view of kind of continuum mechanics, it makes sense. But, but that... Um, Somehow, it me maybe it means there's like a spectral rigidity that we need to understand but that we don't understand. But there you can see it oscillating now. And, and um, yep. Okay. And it's actually accelerating throughout that entire region. It's accelerating. Okay. Okay. So this is a plot of the velocity of the soliton peak. Okay. And so as you can see, it's, it's, uh, it starts to interact with the gas and the velocity is baseline is still the, basically the velocity of the soliton as though it were propagating in a vacuum. But um, in between each of these baselines, it, it has a very large jump. And the average of that, the average of that is what satisfies the kinetic equation. So this is just a slide to say that if I average out all those oscillations, I get something which is now uh, slowly increasing and it solves the kinetic equation that I described before, okay? So just uh, in, in uh, closing, many, uh, if not all, of the features of a soliton gas in the presence of randomness, which people observe numerically, okay, many, of all, many, if not all, of those features uh, exist in explicit deterministic solutions with no randomness, very, very regular initial conditions. Okay? And is this because of a concentration of measure? I, I, 
think it must be, but, but sort, of, sort of an analysis of that is, is uh, maybe that's the place where it connects to the, some of the topics of, of this conference, okay? Um, and then, uh, although I think that like, if, if we study the correlation decay of the field, that's gonna have phenomena that are not present in the, if, if the situation is deterministic. That's my guess, okay? Uh, okay, thanks.